Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are when you're joining us. Welcome to How to Talk to Regulators About the Risks to Your Spectrum uh, from World Teleport Association. And I'm Robert Bell, the Executive Director of WTA. If you're not familiar with us, we do two things every day. One of them is to advocate for the interests of teleport operators, and of course, Spectrum is certainly access to Spectrum is certainly one of those uh, interests. But we also work with the community of teleport operators on the ground to promote excellence in their operations, in their technology, in their business practices, making them more competitive, but also a greater contributor to this very, you know, it's very large for us satellite world, uh, which is making our the planet we live on a better place every day as well. Today's agenda is very simple. After a brief introduction from me, we're going to hear a presentation about exactly how you can engage with regulators on your spectrum needs. Uh, that's often not something that teleport operators either understand or perhaps they even consider themselves um, not the right people to be doing that because after all, they are not, uh, they don't own licenses for geo capacity, but they do own some other valuable licenses and regulators need to hear their point of view if they're going to make sensible decisions, which of course, can be valuable to the bottom line. And then we'll finish with a panel discussion among our presenters, as well as a, as a very experienced uh, gentleman who's, who knows the insides of teleport operations from, uh, from one side to the other. WTA's webinar program, as well as much else we do, which is only possible because of the financial support of what we call WTA's industry leader members. They are UTELSAT, Intelsat, Kratos, Liquid Intelligent Technologies, and SES, and we're very, very grateful for their support. So today our panelists, to get right to the business at hand, include Petra Forvig, who is Vice President of Legal and Regulatory Affairs at SES, and Luis Emiliani, who is Manager for Spectrum Development in the Americas for SES, and Jose Sanchez Ruiz, who is Chief Solutions Officer at HISPASAT, as well as serving currently as the Chair of WTA's Board of Directors. But it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to our colleagues at SES to talk about engaging with your regulator on your spectrum needs. Please, uh, Luis and Petra, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Robert, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm Luis Emiliani. I work in the Spectrum Development Group, and uh, um, we deal with matters related to the uh, World Radio Conference, which is one of our topics uh, today, and also with uh, matters related to coordination between systems and market access uh, support, and, and things all revolving around um, the use of the spectrum um, for satellite services. Um, for the next slide, we have our agenda, which um, um, covers a few topics, um, starting with an overview of um, what is the WRC. Um, if you recall, we had a, a webinar um, a year ago where we discussed this um, general topic of WRC as well. Then we would we will be moving to um, the what nat national regulators do, what is their perspective on, on the matter, and why why it's important to engage with them. And then we will um, close by um, giving you some ideas on, on, on topics that are relevant and, and spectrum consultations and participating in spectrum consultations as a key mechanism to um, inform regulators about uh, your views on, on the various topics related to spectrum management. So let's begin uh, with a recap of uh, the WRC and the WRC process. Um, in essence, well, the WRC is a conference that take, takes place every four years and in which uh, decisions about the use of the radio spectrum and orbits are made. And those decisions affect the services that can be deployed in those frequencies and how the services should be deployed in terms of uh, power levels and, and things like that. WRC decisions lay the groundwork for the deployment of future services, including satellite, terrestrial, uh, fixed or mobile. Uh, the work of the um, WRC is uh, divided into agenda items, which uh, represent this uh, block of works dealing with uh, specific frequencies and services. Those decisions are then um, once made by the um, conference, uh, those decisions are entered into the radio regulations, and at that moment they become an international treaty and countries uh, must abide by it. And in this particular cycle, uh, next slide, we have um, four agenda items that we'd like to bring to your attention as examples of opportunities um, for the satellite industry and risks to um, the activities that we uh, carry out uh, with our services. 
now I hand over to you, Petra, to discuss uh, the role of uh, national regulators in this context of the uh, WRC. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. I am Petra Vorwig. I work with Luis. I'm in our legal and regulatory group. Uh, um, and because we are responsible for advocating for spectrum use and uh, technical and operational policies, we work really, really closely with our um, engineering colleagues. Um, so as Luis went over the international scope of developing spectrum policy, and the radio regulations, that then flows down to, frankly, where a lot of the work is done all day, every day, both for the regulations that apply in your, in the countries that you care about, but then eventually also at the WRC. Um, so if we could continue with the building the slides, please. Um, so, but what's important, and because we are encouraging all of you to engage regularly with your regulators, um, it is important to note that while the WRC develops these radio regulations and they are in place for countries to adopt, each country and their regulators have their own considerations when they're bringing these, um, it, you know, into their into their own national regulation. So, um, as we are encouraging to engage with them in, informally, but also through consultations. And what we have here are just some things to keep in mind when you're dealing with the regulators that you have to work with. You know, they have a lot of things they have to worry about, frankly, um, with their own countries and how spectrum is going to be used in their country. So population, um, what their infrastructure already looks like, what their economy looks like, and what the goals of their, what are the goals that their governments have already set. If you could please, I think there's a couple more bullets on that slide. Um, so, you know, when they are engaging in, in, in looking at how spectrum can be used and what spectrum is available for which services in their countries, they have these considerations in their mind, and they're looking at how existing services in that spectrum meet those needs versus the promise of new services that could also benefit from the spectrum. So they will often put out consultations, and this happens on a regular basis, I think, and Louise, correct me, but I think Saudi Arabia put out four or five consultations in one year that all touched on satellite spectrum. So this happens very, very frequently. And really, this is the best opportunity for you as a stakeholder to engage with the regulator and tell them what you're doing, what spectrum is important to you, and why they need to ensure that you have access to it, not just the satellite operators, but that you as the, the ground system operators can also access it. And so this is really um, what all regulators are doing all the time, right? They're balancing. They're trying to balance the what, what is needed for the existing services versus the new services. You know, we think it's important that regulators take into account the full view of their communications environment. So what we often see when we're engaging with regulators, particularly when it's when they might be looking at repurposing, satellite spectrum is there's a, a focus on, you know, the um, terrestrial, what they what they see and they work with every day, um, but they may not appreciate the role that, say, a satellite service plays in their overall uh, communications ecosystem. So that's part of the messaging when you're talking to your regulator is to keep, make sure that they know what you do and what how important it is to the, the ecosystem they already have. So I think, Luis, um, I will hand this back over to you. Thank you. And and, and this slide kind of sets uh, the theme as to what we want to discuss today. Um, in the uh, WTA uh, reports on mobile interference uh, last year, one of the main um, aspects that, that caught my eye was how, um, as members, we are more concerned about potential for uh, interference across well, not only mobile band, which is specific to this slide, but in general. But at the same time, there is an, a, not a lot of engagement with the regulators. And, and the question, of course, is, is how do we en engage with regulators and which opportunities do we have to do that? Of course, as, as service providers, you probably regularly have to talk to regulators to update them on the use of your spectrum, the use of your services, and, and every every chance you have um, to engage with them in these type of conversations becomes an opportunity as well, not only to refresh the status of your license, 
practices, but to inform on the type of services you provide and the impact in your economy. And of course, that those are the formal opportunities, but as usual, there are lots of informal opportunities to meet with people in, in conferences, in events, and also have informal discussions on, on the nature of the businesses that you provide. Could you? Um, but yeah, this is, so as, as Luis was saying, um, so this is how you all, through WTA, through any other organizations that you are a party to, can really engage in at all the different levels. Um, so you have an opportunity um, as individuals to, to go to the national level, of course, because you engage with your regulator all the time in your licensing um, uh, processes and consultations. Um, but you can also engage at an international level, particularly through these organizations, because they are consolidating input from a number of industry uh, participants. Um, so, you know, really take advantage of those memberships if you are there. Right. So the first uh, of the agenda items that, that we're going to discuss uh, deal with the um, topics associated to the use of the C-band spectrum for um, 5G services or IMT. This is uh, what is contained in agenda items 1.2 and 1.3, which deal with um, multiple frequency bands, including the not only well, the C-band, of course, 3.4 to 3.6, 3.8 to 4, to 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz, uh, 6 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz as potential bands for deploying IMT services in, in um, region 2 in, in the Americas. And agenda item 1.3, which deals with um, increasing the priority of or the status of the mobile service from secondary to primary in region one in, in the frequency bands of the c-band and there are um, as, as you participate in, in spectrum consultations or as you approach a regulator on the matters that are specific to this spectrum in the c-band i think there are I have three points that i'd like to to bring out um, to your attention to, to keep in mind one is um, of course, that there is already 17 gigahertz of spectrum identified with close to 2 gigahertz of spectrum in the low to mid frequency band. So between, let's say, 800 megahertz to um, 4.9 gigahertz, which is spectrum that is ready today for use and can, and can be um, assigned to, to mobile operators. Um, uh, and as Peter was saying, um, because 5G is at the forefront um, of, the, of, of the communications, uh, so to speak, of the day-to-day -day, uh, messaging, because you have a device in your hand, then it's very easy for regulators to, to see exactly what 5G could do for economy. But satellite services, as important as they are, they are sometimes acting behind the scenes, so to speak. So that the whole ecosystem is connected. Satellite services support deployment of 5G base stations via trunking or IP trunking or, or cellular backhaul. Fixed services, which are also operating in, in the same bands we operate around 6 gigahertz, for example, they also contribute to support the deployment of networks. And we are all connecting, supporting each other. So moving, um, giving preferences to certain services um, against others in the end uh, ends up hurt, uh, hurting the entire telecommunications ecosystem. So as part of the communications that, uh, as part of those conversations that you could have with regulators, keep them um, informed about the type of solutions you provide uh, and, and how your solutions impact um, the local economy in order to get them, uh, to make them aware of, of all the connections that exist in the, in the, the ecosystem. And finally, there is a last recommendation which is um, in the specific case of, of C-band, of course, registering your C-band air stations, even if they are uh, operating in receive-only mode, is useful to inform the regulator not only of the type of the services you provide, where you provide them, but also about the number of stations that are involved in, in the services, because all of these um, provides them with information regarding also the, the needs for protection of services when um, for example, 5G services are deployed either on the same band or in a band adjacent to those to that where um, satellite uh, services are provided. Uh, Petra, this, uh, the next slide is on uh, eSIMs and air stations in motion, so I, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Yeah, so this is another agenda item, um, which you know may not be applicable to all of your membership, but I certainly think it's an important one to keep in mind uh, for you know for broad service providers. Um, so agenda item 1.16 uh, is carrying forward a lot of the work that was already done in previous uh, works for the GSO. And it's looking at introducing and authorizing non-GSO satellites in the KA band or eSIM services. So it's establishing technical, 
technical conditions for the operations of those types of eSIMs, which again is um, largely based on the work that was previously done. Um, and so, you know, we see these types of mobility services really as a, a, again, a part of the broader mobility services that many of you are offering to your customers. You know, keeping with the theme of, of, of talking with your regulators, it's important for them to understand what you're doing, what your customers look like, um, how your services are benefiting the local economy, economy and help them understand what the, the proposed operational constraints um, how, how those might impact what you're trying to do. And also help them understand that particular licensing mechanisms that are under consideration may be more beneficial without undermining, you know, the, the intentions of the regulator. So we see this in a lot of um, countries now um, that are looking at licensing eSIMs. And it's important from our perspective that they really consider blanket licensing, for example, for, for eSIMs, because it makes the licensing process for these types of mobile terminals so much simpler, but doesn't really undermine the spectrum use or other sort of concerns that um, regulators may have. Um, so so those are that's the information that's very important to share with them. And, if, and I think what's important for them to understand in this, because is it, a, it, it is the next stage of work that has previously been done in, on ESIM specifically in the cave, and by adopting this um, sort of the, the, what has been proposed in this um, agenda item, it's actually going to simplify the burden on them, because similar analysis will need to be done. The antennas, frankly, will be very similar in the way they operate. Um, and so it obvious, it's replicating all the success that has already occurred rather than basically reinventing the wheel. Um, so if we could... Uh, right, and this um, this next point of the agenda item 119 is about opening up new opportunities for spectrum in the Americas. And it's about harmonizing use of the spectrum across regions. So with this agenda item, um, the satellite services would have access to additional capacity in the range of 17.3 to 21.2 gigahertz, which could be um, which would be used to expand um, the access to um, broadband networks that, that we have today. So, with the next couple of points, uh, as we did in the previous two um, agenda items, we will highlight how this benefits you, and 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 we also try to give you ideas on on seeing it from the regulator's perspective. So, of course, the first thing is that this additional capacity. Uh, would be readily available for you um, to exploit uh, as part of your forward and return link services. But of course, um, we need two sites for this to work. You need the space infrastructure and the ground infrastructure. And additionally, as the spectrum would be harmonized in the direction of uh, space to earth, so the downlink, the coordination of air stations with other terrestrial services would not be required, which simplifies um, air station licensing in the band. Then um, what is there for regulators is that they would benefit um, from understanding when you could get access to this spectrum, right? When, from a teleport perspective, from a service provider perspective, when would you be ready to exploit this new allocation? And that gives them an idea of the timeline to exploit um, the spectrum. So, and I'll make your, your due diligence, do your assessments on your networks and inform regulators of the capabilities of your systems and how soon could you use this spectrum as a mechanism to give them ideas on how important this would be for your for your business. With this, we finish our um, views on the four key agenda items. Just to summarize, uh, next slide, uh, Robert. To summarize, we discuss four points, right? Um, one agenda items 1.2, 1.3, we deal with um, um, risks to our um, fixed satellite service spectrum around the C-band and we discuss the two agenda items that represent opportunities for the satellite industry. Agenda item 1.16 which deals with um, air stations in motion operating in non-geo networks and agenda item 119 which deals with an additional allocation of spectrum for satellite services uh, in the downlink path which is of course uh, beneficial uh, to all the industry as it would allow us to expand networks. So what can you do? With, as Petra discussed, as a, as, a, as a company, you can interact with your national um, 
regulatory entity to give them this perspective of your business, your local views, which satellite operators can not always provide because you, no one knows better than you your, your own business, right? We only see one side of the picture. So as, as a company, as a member of the WTA, you can engage with your national regulator, but as an organization, WTA, you can all get together, build common positions around the agenda items that interest you and build your views to participate in, in, in in consultations as an organization and you know many voices are louder than a single voice so as an organization you can be very effective and also participate uh, perhaps together with other industry groups whenever that is possible and have joint positions and then use those joint positions to, to answer to national consultations or even um, in regional uh, regional meetings like uh, the CEPT meetings or the CTEL meetings in, in the Americas. And of course, the key message that I want to, to leave you with is to clarify the importance of your services to your regulators, raise the profile of your services, and um, issue statements, perhaps in the WTA website, illustrating your positions and uh, with case studies, reminding um, um, viewers and, and regulators and the, the industry in general of, of how important the satellite services satellite services are to, to the economy. And the other thing you can do in the specific case of, uh, of the C-band spectrum is work with regulators to shape the operational conditions under which these mobile services can be deployed, right? So it's not only about um, the use of the spectrum, but once some regulators, um, once the regulators make decisions, as some have done, like Brazil, like um, the US and, and Saudi Arabia and others, uh, the technical conditions on which these services services will operate are very important in order to understand how coexistence uh, between the mobile and the satellite services is possible. So participate in those debates, uh, not only at the beginning of the discussion, but also when decisions on technical levels are going to be made, as you did, for example, during the uh, CBAN procedures in the US, and, and connect with other um, members and, and consider also participating with other groups to further increase um, uh, the, the level of your voice, so to speak. So with this, we uh, we finish our views. We we can move to the Q and A. We thank you again for the opportunity, uh, Robert uh, and WTA, um, um, of providing you with these views and this presentation. Well, thank thank you both. Um, and now is the chance to talk a little bit about this. I'm reminded, listening to your presentation, of something that a former chair of WCA once said to me that I've carried around in my, my mind ever since. He said, the single biggest mistake you can make in communicating is to think that you have. And I think that we're all subject to that problem here in the, in the teleport business and in the satellite business. You know, we think our regulators understand our business, but if I had to sum up your entire presentation, the answer is they probably don't. And it's, that means that you're going to be subject to people regulating your business who don't understand what you do. That's not a good mix. So just to start off, I just I would like to briefly ask each of the panelists, including the two we've heard from, just tell, tell us a little bit about them so we'll understand their point of view as they speak. So Petra, would you go first? Sorry, so just a background of, of what I'm doing? Yeah, just, what, yeah what, do you, what, what do you do for a living every day? I talk to regulators every day. <laughs> That's my job. That sounds pretty exciting um, so to me. So this, uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think the point you just raised is a really, really good one in that even if they're regulators that you work with for licenses, the folks who are making decisions about Spectrum might not be the people that you work with on a regular basis. So you really do have to make sure that the ones that are you know, listing the consultations or doing the analysis, those are the people you're talking to in a particular case because they they don't know necessarily what you're doing and how important it is. Um, and so, yes, and some of the, you know, in, in talking to the regulators, you know, we, we use a lot of the, the things that Luis mentioned, which is, you know, we're obviously engaging through you, your, you guys and through other associations. But, um, you know, one thing that came to mind is, you know, consider working with your customers when it's relevant. You know, if you can, um, you know, in certain situations, it's very powerful if the service provider and the com com uh, customers can come in and tell the regulator how those decisions that they're contemplating could impact the whole ecosystem again. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I do. <laughs> well, thank you. And it's a very good point. I think that, you know, is, is one of the reasons that we're doing these webinars here at WTA is because I've come to realize that spectrum issues sound like it's a regulatory bureaucratic process, which it is, 
but it's business development. <laughs> it is ultimately a business development responsibility. So Luis, just tell us a little bit about yourself if you would be so kind. Thank you. So uh, uh, briefly, not to take too much time from uh, Mr. Reed that comes after and hasn't spoken. Um, uh, my name is Luis Emiliani, I work uh, with Petra. I work with other members of the regulatory team in the Spectrum Development Group. I've been with SCS for about 12 years and, and been moving on over time on the different roles and uh, been with the Spectrum Group for now uh, two years. And um, as, Petra, as Petra said, we, every day we talk to regulators, we participate in consultations. For example, right now we have four going, one in Canada on, on matters related to 60 gigahertz, two in Brazil, one dealing with 28 uh, gigahertz services and another dealing with 4.9 gigahertz services. And there is another one in Belgium dealing with um, licensing of first station. So these are again the four things that I'm juggling with right now. And at the same time, you know, the ITU process and, and dealing with um, sharing studies between a mobile and, and satellite services as part of these two agenda items I just mentioned, one to two, one to three. Well, and finally, we get to offer the floor to um, Jose Sanchez. Uh, we, of course, heard from SES on this topic. They put a huge amount of work into raising awareness of this issue. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jose, and also, you know, where, where, how does HISPASAT look at this? Myself, uh, I've been uh, I've been running uh, payload and, and service operations for for many years, uh, for previously for other satellite operators and now for Hispasat, uh, and building solutions and uh, and services uh, based on that. And uh, uh, in that context, I have been facing the, the problems of the interferences from different angles. So first of all, from the satellite operator running the payload, so facing interferences. Uh, when using the spectrum, uh, and, and it can be both on the on the way up and uh, on the on the receive side, uh, but also running the teleports in uh, in the satellite operator, and also uh, buying services from other satellite operators to package them and build solutions for our customers, uh, facing the problems of regulation and interferences uh, of those uh, teleports, and then uh, and then uh, finally also. Uh, uh, today, with a with a more and more complex uh, uh, situation, we're facing new uh, scenarios of of uh, interferences, of uh, coordination that are every day more challenging. I would say, hmm. yeah. which I think pretty much describes absolutely everything going on in anything to do with with technology and, and service these days. Um, I was going to ask a question about you know sort of what's wrong with the the picture that that uh, Luis outlined in that slide from our our uh, studied last December, but I think it's pretty clear. But what I want to ask, and this is going to sort of call on SES to, to sum up some of the things that we've heard, but what are the hot buttons for the regulators? So if I'm going to take the time to treat um, spectrum as a business development issue, and therefore I'm going to make sure to talk not just to the person who processes my license related requests, but to find some other people, higher levels to begin to really explain and brief on what goes on, what do I need to focus on? You want me to take that one, Luis? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Um, yeah, you want me to go first? You know, I, can, yeah, I can trigger. I can trigger the conversation. <laughs> um, no, I, I can go. So, sorry, I'm getting a little delay. I apologize if I'm a little bit slow on the connection. But um, so it's interesting because I'm not sure you could identify a universal hot button because so much. It's like everything, right? It's like politics. It's like everything. It's local. At the end of the day, everything is local. So that's why it's actually really, really important that you're in the regions or the countries that you really care about. You stay informed about what about what they care about, because that's how you're going to connect with them. What your what your needs are, right? How you're already because you know. I, I think others have said this before so many times when regulators come out, particularly when it's something uh, spectrum, they, they want to repurpose spectrum, for, for example, it's everybody says, no, you can't possibly, it'll be the end of our, our business that, you know, you can't, but until you it, explain why they should care <laughs> if your business, you know, if this is so hard on your business, like, and that, that always has to put, sort of be done in a more positive way, which is this is what we are doing for you all. And this is either, you know how that could be diminished by what you're contemplating or and frankly in case in the situation of um the 
1.19, that was an example of, of operators talking to their regulators about how they needed more spectrum. And so that actually moved forward as an opportunity for satellite services to get access to more spectrum. So, um, and, and that, you know, again, in, in the regions that cared about that, it's access to improved broadband services. So, uh, so it's, a, it's, I think it's difficult, at least from my perspective, Luis may have a different view, but, um, you know, it, it's hard to say globally that there's just one or two. Luis, so you, you, need to keep, you need to keep, you need to keep your ear to the ground in terms of what's going to be important in your country. Luis. Yes, uh, no, I, I agree uh, with Petra. From, from the perspective of the conversation we're having today, it is it is about you know, you know, local matters, right? It, and, and the knowledge that you have on your business and the impact you you have on your um, on your country or, or the region you're working when when you are a multi-country company. Keeping the regulator informed about what you do is, is is extremely important to let them understand the impact that their policies could have. So it is, uh, as you said, is ne never take for granted that that uh, they know what you do or who you are, and keep them always um, informed. So I would say that that's 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 if there's one thing to 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 take out from this discussion is is that is inform constantly the regulator about your business and, and how you are evolving to and the things you plan to do in the future because they have a long-term view right they they have spectrum planning cycles 10 15 years in the future and so that's the view you need to keep as well yeah absolutely um all right so in the in the run-up to i'm sorry wrong wrong question um let's just talk about operations for a moment so we're, we're going to move out of regulatory and into operations from an operational standpoint how are teleport and satellite operators uh, dealing with rising terrestrial interference now? And the interesting question beyond that, of course, is that going to be sustainable going forward? And, and Jose, I'd like to call on you first because that's something you have to do. Yeah, well, I, I think they they name it. I think the problem is the fragmentation on the regulation, and uh, it's very local to not to regions but also to to countries, and uh, this becomes. Uh, quite uh, challenging because in every country you have different uh, a different approach i think that the bigger problem is that uh, uh, there is a big pressure from mobile applications uh, to that they are eating spectrum <laughs> with a <laughs> with a very intensive way and uh, and they have a strong power uh, uh, with the regulators uh, globally and, and locally so the problem is on the on the satellite side we are small, we are not uh, very visible, and uh, if you stay quiet, uh, the regulators, they don't know what are your, your intentions, what are your needs, and uh, in front of you, you have somebody that is asking for, 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 for a spectrum all the time. So at the end of the day, you are the last in the queue to access to, to the capacity, and you need to compete to that, uh, to get it. And uh, it, it's, it's very fragmented, as I say. I mean, there are countries where, there are licenses for accessing the K spectrum that has been given to the mobile operators. So a satellite operator or a teleport operator that wants to access to the spectrum needs to coordinate with the different uh, uh, stakeholders there, which would be not only the regulator, but all the mobile operators that have already acquired those uh, licenses. Uh, in some other countries, uh, you have uh, more uh, margin to talk to the regulator and to get even protection for for your teleport, so you you have priorities and and actually uh, mobile operators will have to coordinate with you. But very few cases like that I hear in in the past. And there are cases like uh, uh, in KBAN in the in the 27.5 uh, 2035 uh, in North America uh, in this frequency band. Uh, uh, it's a very complex uh, scenario where uh, actually there are limitations in terms of uh, power that can be transmitted uh, by county. Uh, up to that's the point county. where that's by county, by of which there are a very large number in the United States. Okay. Yes, yeah, exactly. So you need to go county by county uh, to to find out where you could uh, uh, potentially put uh, um, an antenna in this frequency. Uh, with uh, brings you to a different scenario because uh, uh, in that context uh, you you can't forget the traditional vision of a teleport, like a place where you put uh, together the antennas and is a is a is a bridge between the the ground network, the services you're building, and the satellites. Uh, uh, because of the limitations in terms of uh, power you can transmit and all that, uh, you can put one or two antennas together in a county and, and, and no more. So you end up uh, going to uh, the middle of nowhere 
in places where uh, at the end of the day it's difficult to get the connectivity, it's difficult to get even the power and the water for for running uh, uh, the facilities. And those facilities will be just for one or two antennas, and they will not scale up to 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 become a large or even a medium-sized uh, teleport. No? So it's uh, it's becoming very challenging because of that. And uh, and then uh, in some other countries uh, they have uh, 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 traditionally they copy the mirror what uh, the first uh, are doing, including what the first are doing drawn. So uh, <laughs> you you find out that uh, uh, decisions like that could be copied in in other countries, and this makes uh, life very complex for 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 satellite operators and and for uh, teleport operators for sure. I remember an Australian uh, operator telling me about the fact, that, very similar story, that they just can't put up KA band facilities in their in their cities. Um, and so, what they're, they're so we keep getting these requests for you know put an antenna in the middle of the outback and have a massive fiber con, con, you know connectivity to it, and it's it's 200 kilometers away from the nearest city. <laughs> it's like, no, we don't have a teleport there. Okay, there's nobody there, but they're yeah. they're starting to build them for just the reason you're talking about. So yeah, huge impact. Um, the <laughs> Petra already referred to this, but the business world has a really bad habit when it comes to regulation. Um, whenever there is a proposal for change of any kind, the most likely reaction from the affected company is to claim that A, it will be put out of business, B, it will double the price for their users or consumers, and three, it will be the end of the world in a hailstorm of fire. Um, so regulators can be forgiven for, you know, sometimes rolling their eyes uh, at us. But when it comes to spectrum up for debate in 2023, these these four um, I'm going to get them wrong blocks or four four actions that um, you focused us on, what's different this year? What's critical this year that's coming up that you really want to make sure that not only the WRC is aware of our position, but also your national regulators are aware of our position? And that's a question for either Petra or Luis or both. So, so let me go first, and, and of course, I just want to remind you that um, we have not only threats, but also opportunities as part of the agenda items of, of WRC. So, of course, uh, the first thing to, to address is, is the threat uh, based on the question. And I think one thing to remember, as we said in our uh, discussion, is that uh, there is already, when you aggregate over all frequencies, about 17 gigahertz of spectrum already uh, identified for for uh, for mobile services for IMT specifically for for 5G. So that the threat is is this is the next phase, and, and we're now discussing um, not only uh, another portion of the C band, which was already under discussion in previous uh, conference, like like the one in 2015, but also the beginning of the discussion around. Uh, was 6, 7 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz, because part of the discussion in agenda item 1 to 2 is the 10 to 10.5 gigahertz band, which is very close to 10.7, which is where we start. And, and we now need to go look into LMBs uh, deployed for uh, satellite services in 10.7 to 12.2 gigahertz to determine the frequency response and how exposed we could be to high power emissions in the range 10 to 10.5 gigs. So this is also a long-term thing because uh, agenda item one to two, uh, whatever the decision is, doesn't mean that the next, the very next day they will they will be hardware in 10 gigahertz running um, base stations, right? But but it's the beginning of of the next phase of of assigning more spectrum that is very close or inside satellite spectrum. So it is it is critical that we inform regulators of all of these aspects and. We kept everything in mind, and at the same time, just also to flip a bit the the thing, it is also the opportunities. Let's also recognize that there are a couple of interesting opportunities around um, mobile stations and around uh, KA spectrum that uh, that we also need to to you know, take advantage of. And Petra, any anything else you want to add? Uh, no, actually, I think you covered that very well. Thank you. Well, it's nice. I appreciate your your emphasis on opportunities because one does. It's very easy to get locked into the view that this is just a losing battle, and we're going to keep losing and keep losing because, as uh, as Jose said, we're at the end of the queue, um, and it's not just that way. Um, and so, basically, the world is going to end in a hailstorm of fire, or or no, not so much. 
Okay, then I'm not going to get an answer on that one. Um, so let, I just want to put it very, very basic for the, the again, for the point, the, the value of our listeners. Um, you've already said this, but what, in your view, are the most effective things that teleport operators can do? You know, the top three or four things that they should be thinking about doing this next year that's outside of their regular connections with regulatory agencies. Um, so if you could just, you know, tell us that in plain, in plain words um, so that people can write them down and remember them. Well, um, other than individual action, um, consider if you haven't already done it, um, national or regional associations that you may participate in. So um, obviously this is a global group, um, so you're, you know, you're looking very, very widely, but engaging with a local or regional association that's going to have maybe better Hey, they're monitoring consultations probably better than a global organization can simply by resources, right? Um, but they're going to have a better um, sense of what the key issues are. So that's certainly one I would recommend. Um, Louise, do you have one you want to add? Or Jose, sorry. Well, I, I would just say, on, for example, first, what, sorry. Yeah, and I would just say that is first participate in consultations, inform regulators of what you do. Um, as we said, um, 5G is very prominent in, in their view. Is you know, networks uh, messaging is very strong. Satellite um, kind of operates a bit in the background. We power, power everything else, but we probably are not as visible uh, directly to. to to the layman, so to speak, the day-to-day -day persons, because they have a mobile in their hand, they don't have a, they don't have a visa in their in their houses. Although that is changing, so that that will also help. So participate in consultations. We have four, as I said, two in Brazil, one in Belgium, one in Canada. Inform the regulator of everything you do and what your plans are. It, together, we we carry out that message that then we can start to 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 get um, the regulators more aware of of the impact that changes in regulation will have on our business. Businesses. Um, Jose, anything you want to add? Yeah. yeah well, I will say that uh, you have to make yourself visible to the to the local stakeholders uh, in your in your country. Uh, this is country by country, so it can be the regulator. In some cases, it could be in some other cases the the the, the mobile operators or any, any other entity that has already licenses uh, uh, that are shared with uh, with you. So you you can negotiate with them. And uh, the best you can achieve is to have protection uh, for your teleport, meaning that uh, in an area around it, uh, you, you have purity uh, among other services. I think that was very important. Declare your stations, also receive the stations, because these give you some uh, some rights, uh, some guarantees. Uh, it depends also on the countries, but uh, declare your stations and uh, yeah. Make you visible um, and show the importance of uh, the, the activity that the teleports are, are are carrying out. Yeah, it's. I remember from 2019 in the run up to that WRC, there was a very large study done led by the satellite industry of C band uh, receive onlys in Brazil for some reason, and it was you know it turned out that when you actually turned the rug over and looked underneath, there were hundreds of thousands of C band receive only antennas that people depended on. So yeah, they. They're invisible unless you make them visible. Um, a question from our, our uh, one of our members of our audience uh, talking about just is there an opportunity because you have a set of ITU regional meetings, uh, regional meetings, and then the ITU main main meetings coming up. Is there an opportunity uh, that's worth taking to to get onto their program to try to deliver some some content, whether it's a lecture or something else, as part of the program, or is that already happening and is that already in train? So as far as um, ITU meetings, I'd say there are uh, let's let's split them in two. So there are there are meetings of the working groups that are discussing the agenda item um, um, work. Uh, to participate in those meetings, you can, you need to be either a sector member or an associate member or an, an administration. So it, through your regulator, you could figure out. Well, countries like Colombia, for example, they have a um, 
they have working groups that deal with these thing, things at national level that are open. You can participate uh, by registering on the website of the um, ANE, for example, the, the Spectrum Agency. And make your views there, present your proposals and, and your perspectives, and then become part of the national process that builds a national position that is, that is then taken uh, up to the regional level and finally to the WRC. So it is possible to, to participate and influence what's happening in the working groups by going through your national um, and local processes. And, and there are other sets of meetings, of workshops and seminars of the ITU, which are not part of the WRC, but they also represent an opportunity to provide your views and, and you know, through case studies, for example, how you use the spectrum and what services you provide. And, and those are, are led by the uh, development arm of the ITU, ITUD, but also by the radio group, by the ITU arm, and they do regu uh, regional uh, workshops on, on radio spectrum use. Those are publicly available uh, on the website of the ITU, so you could also get in touch with the organizers and perhaps propose um, content for those for those things. So, so two ways to do it, through your regulator for the form thing and, and through um, the ITUR directly for, for this uh, this type of workshops. Okay, so you don't just you don't just show up with your PowerPoint deck and hope for the best. Um, you know, spectrum is finite and demand for it is <laughs> knows absolutely no limits whatsoever. So my question is, you know, as we seek to commercialize higher and higher and higher bands, um, and I know that's one of the opportunities that that you mentioned, Luis. Um, Assuming that we can master the technology, because people in our industry always say it can't be done. They said it about KU, they said it about KA. Are we going to run into other limits, other competitors waiting up there for us? Or is there basically you know, sort of a territory that we can ultimately, through technology, move to that is unlikely to be in demand in other markets? And that's a, this is a totally speculative question, but I'm just curious what your views are on that. Jose, do you want to go first on that? Well, I, I will let them answer first. If you <laughs> okay. Wise man, wise man. <laughs> okay, let me, yeah, let me take a stab at it. So, of course, it's uh, whenever we are dealing with with a resource that is uh, somewhat limited, and um, spectrum is, and I mean there are some limits to it. Of course, uh, we will find situations in which um, multiple services want access to the same spectrum. So we see that today as well in Q, V bands, E bands, so 40 gigs, 50 gigs, 100 gigs. So there are already um, 6G interests and Wi-Fi interests uh, on some other bands uh, looking for that spectrum at the same time that we are trying to deploy the next generation satellite networks that operate in the Q and V bands, right? So, so there will of course be bands that are going to be as assigned or allocated to specific services that may be easier to use than others, but for sure we will run into um, bands in which we are sharing with other services and therefore the conditions of use would need to be negotiated so to speak between the parties so yes of course this is a situation that, that we expect to continue into the future uh, Petra anything you want to add no I am curious though if um, Jose wants to add anything following that well, no, not really. I mean, it's uh, it's difficult to know what is going to come as uh, the next challenge uh, in general. Uh, surely there will be, but it's difficult to predict uh, what it's going to be. Yeah. The Same only thing way. that I, I wanted to add there is uh, is sorry, uh, Robert. So is uh, is that uh, and it's also related to the opportunities you you were mentioning, which is opening uh, the door for 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 new. Uh, New spectrum allocated to to satellite. Uh, there is a there is a, a big challenge for um, for the industry, which is to develop the the terminals, the the units in those new frequencies. Uh, uh, this, the economy of scale that we have is not the same as the one of the mobile uh, operators, and and it's always challenging to introduce uh, new technology where you need to develop new LMBs, you need to de develop new terminals. Uh, get to the point where you have a sufficient uh, economy of scale to to make it profitable this is always challenging you know? and uh, and then uh, we're moving to the very high frequencies uh, uh, not in the sense of very high frequencies which are very low <laughs> uh, vhf uh, but uh, moving to q and, and, and v band uh, we are exploring these uh, these new frequencies uh, but this is particularly for the gateways uh, to the to the satellites um, uh, and then you're facing new challenges because uh, because uh, uh, those frequencies are very sensitive to to weather conditions that are that for traditional frequency bands uh, are normal 
uh, what I mean is that uh, it now the point is not necessarily whether if it is raining or not and the size of the drops of the rain, but uh, it could be the point where <laughs> is it cloudy? That could be sufficient to degrade the, the, the link, right? So, which means that you need to develop new techniques uh, to fast switch from from a gateway to a backup gateway, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, it, it's always comes to the point where uh, the technology can uh, can uh, manage the new challenges, but it takes time uh, and uh, money and effort, right? It does indeed. Um, just a real quick question. And this is again speculative and it's extreme, but you know most of this regulatory work, if you will, happens in a place it doesn't get much attention. It's very, very, it's a lot of work going on. It's very important work, but it doesn't necessarily, if you will, get the headlines. And then there was the C band repack in the U.S., which, which has been an ongoing thing for for quite some time and is you know beginning to achieve some success. Are we going to see some more such deals? Do you think in our future where we you know? try to get where our industry tries to get ahead of the pressure that that jose referred to from the whole industry and say okay here's here's what we're going to do this far and no farther and again this is nobody knows the answer to this question but i'm just curious whether whether you kind of expect that to happen in the future petra why don't we start with you uh yeah thank you <laughs> yes i worked a lot on that one um <laughs> so but i do think i i think that that particular repack, and you've probably heard this already, is, is was very unique um, in its situation. And, uh, and it was uh, unique, not only in how it played out, but really the spectrum situation that it was addressing, right? The U.S. had different blocks that weren't available. And so, you know, that, that led to this situation. But I think what, what's interesting about it is that it highlights um, some of the key elements of this, this type of repack, right? It is, it is a big amount of work. It, it reaches back even to the point that you made about the Brazilian Earth stations. The FCC actually had very little idea how many Earth stations out there were actually receiving C-band until the satellite operators, frankly, put a, a lot of effort into getting those Earth stations registered. So, and only then could they appreciate what the, what the impact of this whole thing would be and saw that it was a lot of work that it's very expensive, that it's very time consuming. And so, you know, those elements, um, and also has to be very coordinated, right? When you have so many different parties involved just to transition one service. So I think those, those um, aspects that were highlighted in that, um, in that particular process, which is still go going on, um, are important to highlight to others who may be considering this because what we're seeing as more people are looking at possible, you know, repurposing of C-band, they don't really have an appreciation for how complex it will be to actually move services out of out of those um, frequencies and the impact it has not just locally but regionally right because of the way um, satellites work and c band in particular which are very wide beams so um so you know i can't say if there will be more deals like that but i think it's a, definitely a very interesting case study that you know certainly can be um, used in discussions with regulators who may be contemplating us. I think we'll stop there because that's probably the best answer we're going to get. Um, it reminds me of a conversation I ever heard in an elevator uh, when my wife was working for a bank that was going through, had just finished an enormous merger and there were rumors that another one was, was coming and these two people in front of me in the elevator, not knowing I was listening, said, I just don't know if I can do this again. <laughs> <laughs> So human be, human, being a human being puts limits on things. I want to just take a moment to thank very much Petra Vorvig. Uh, I thought, assumed you were a German, Petra. I got it all wrong. You're, you're, you're American like me. Luis Emiliani and Jose Sanchez Ruiz for sharing their, their insights and their thoughts with us. Um, coming up, WTA is going to be uh, sending people to NAB Las Vegas in April, to CABSAT in May, and to Communication in June. If you'd like to meet with us, talk about the possibilities of membership or about any of our programs that are of interest to you, please just send an email to rbarney at worldteleport.org. And then in uh, later this month, we're going to be publishing, actually very, very soon, I think it's actually happening this week, uh, we're publishing a new report, Growth Opportunities in Satellite Cellular Integration, which of course is, is cellular backhaul has been a huge business for our industry. It's about to get a lot bigger. And the question is, how do you take advantage of it? 
Uh, and the pros and cons of Leo Gateway business in May. We're asking our members, you know, is this good business? Is there, are, what's going on? It seems to be hot right now. What capabilities are required? Does it have long-term potential for growth? So that brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, again, this has been how to talk to regulators about risks to your spectrum. You'll be